Guys, we made it. 50 episodes. A big milestone for anybody, even if it took me close to five years to do it. So, this can't just be a normal episode. I gotta do something special. And I think I have just the idea. This series and my channel in its current iteration started with a review of Bionicle the Game, one of the first traditional games I played as a kid. But it wasn't the first. There were plenty of other older edutainment and other small games we had for the family computer, so I think now would be as good a time as I need to go back and see what those are like, see how I was shaped into the man I am today. Let's go grab the book though, Captain. I don't know where all those CDs went. It's not surprising, I probably haven't looked in there for 15 or so years, but since I don't have the desire to tear the house apart top to bottom to find them, we're gonna have to substitute it for something else, something different. And what could be more different than reviewing something that isn't a game? Or an essay about an anime series? I've thought about doing movie reviews on here from time to time, probably with the Bionicle movies, but at this point, if I have to talk about Bionicle on this channel again, I'm gonna shoot myself. Fuck. But also, I don't own Mask of Light somehow. So we're just gonna have to do a topic that I can also just talk about. Big monster! Let's take a trip back to Japan. In anticipation of the upcoming American Godzilla movie, which I'm sure was a great success, Toho made headlines in 1995 when they killed Godzilla. Held a funeral for him and everything, with plans to keep him dead for 10 years. But time doesn't stand still, and Toho still needed money in that time, so Toho did what Toho does every time Godzilla's profitability is looking dicey. Thus, 1996, the 35th anniversary of the character, brought us Mothra, renamed to Rebirth of Mothra Overseas to Avoid Confusion. Directed by Okihiro Yoneda, who has done nothing of much else note in any prominent role, and written by Masumi Suetani, who has done nothing else of note, and Tomoyuki Tanaka, kaiju grandfather in one of his final works, how can you go wrong? As the film opens, we get to see something new. Mothra actually laying one of her famous eggs. Ooh, as someone who gets uncomfortable boners from the egg-laying episodes of Monster Musume and Interspecies Reviewers, I'm looking forward to this. Well, that was anticlimactic. Ethereal, but pointless when official cross-sections show that Mothra has the biology to lay eggs the normal way. So far, the movie isn't straying from the Mothra mythos, with Mothra as fluffy as ever, and her twin fairies, Laura and Mole. Mona! Fuck these dubs. Oh! Oh, oh no, I did not. Try Here again. we go! And what's this? Loggers cutting down trees and not respecting nature? Definitely a Mothra movie. Oh, but it's not all bad for these evil humans, cause look, a lucky emblem. A genre-savvy part of me would say that taking this thing out of its hole is bad news, but really, I'd take it too. Make a necklace to give to a loving family, just as Yuichi Goto, one of the loggers, does for his daughter Wakaba. Isn't this just a wonderful family? Oh, it's always work, isn't it? You weren't even here when Wakaba was sick. I told you I couldn't come back, didn't I? Oh, well, forget it. You want to work? Then just get on with it and see if I care. Thank you, Rebirth of Mothra, for teaching me how to pronounce the name of that Suikoden 2 character. But this little coin is now being hunted by another fairy, a third sister to Mole and Laura, Belvera. This incarnation of the Shobijin, or Elias as they refer to here, never caught on. All future Mothra movies would keep the identical characterless twins, and I think that's a shame. 
Moen wore a more defined as individual characters with unique styles of dress to tell them apart, and were there a larger kaiju universe, I could see Belvera as one half of Batra's Shobijin. Mona, Laura, I'm warning you to never trust a human being. Wait, Belvera? Mark my words. Sooner or later, they'll bring about your destruction. You'll see. If bringing Mothra back into the spotlight had any positive ideas, this was one of them. Anyway, in order to get her tiny hands on this coin, Belvera and her itty bitty steed Garu Garu put Wakaba under her control, which gives her psychic powers or something, and... I'd make a joke about not enjoying looking in the mirror, but I have a little more class than that. I don't have to get dressed to record this on my own couch. It's up to her brother Taiki to break her free of the spell, and hey now! Aha, so this is one of those kinds of movies. My initial thoughts weren't out of place. Aha, these movies in particular were made for kids. Taiki isn't alone. The Elias and their pre-made merchandise moth were bust in to have a fight, and... Let's just say Toho's special effects expertise is clearly in making human-sized things look big, not making them look small. And I have plenty of time to think about it, because it's just this for the next six and a half minutes. Also plenty of time to worry whether this family's insurance will cover this. Despite the drawn-out action scene, Belvera gets away with the object, which we finally discover the significance of and why Belvera wants it. Des Ghidorah? Des? Is that anything like death? A terrible space monster that came to Earth 65 million years ago. Desgadora used to wander in outer space, sucking all of the energy out of the planets. Bravely, our ancestors fought the huge monster and locked it inside a rock. They say the Seal of Elias possesses magical powers that can harness universal energy. So as you can see, we must put the seal back as soon as possible. Wait, a creature of death came from space 65 million years ago during the time of the dinosaurs? Damn, between this and Godzilla vs. Space Godzilla, Toho couldn't leave Akira Toriyama alone. It's not mentioned here, but Des Ghidorah is also the classic Ghidorah's relative, originally conceived as his son, and that just makes me think of a Ghidorah family reunion. But because Fairy was injured in the battle, it's time for this family to just go along with what the little people said and smuggle them all through airport security. If I hadn't seen those little people, I would never have believed you. Because that's a normal reaction. But they're too late because... Let's just say things are happening at the site by the time they arrive. that Godzilla presumably doesn't exist in this continuity, because he'd already be washing up on the shore to deck the motherfucker. And the kids sadly aren't up to the task of taking down Ghidorah themselves. You'll have to watch Orochi the Eight-Headed Dragon for that. I'm sure that's a great movie. There's only one in the world able to stand up to Des Ghidorah, but it's not an easy decision for Mole to make. Are you really going to call up Mothra? Mothra is too old, she'll never be able to make it. Why can't we just let her rest in peace? Sadly, there's no one but the aged divine moth that can stand up to Des Ghidorah, so the Elias sing the classic Mothra song and the 2006 YouTube backdrop. <laughs> I got some things to say about this one. It's not just the choppy backdrop from Windows Movie Maker, but the choice of flames to begin with. Of all the images that could be used to represent Mothra, fire is potentially the last one I would pick. And to put cap on it all, I don't particularly like this incarnation of Mothra's song. I would have preferred if they stuck with the 1992 incarnation of the tune. Presumably climbing out of her wheelchair and turning off Matlock, Granny Mothra hears her call and flies out to help. gentlemen, the perfect woman. And I think someone put too much glitter on her. And it seems to be going just as well as your average old woman versus harbinger of extinction fight. 
It's actually kind of distressing seeing such a curb stomp. I'm not the only one who thinks so either, because the idea of mom getting the silk beaten out of her causes the eggs she laid to begin hatching prematurely. So it would seem that unlike previous Mothra incarnations, this one is not meant to be the same character, but a true offspring. That means I'm gonna need a proper name to refer to this one as. Let's check the wiki. God damn, who goes around with six names? And to really make sure you know this is a different moth, cue another song to help it along in the miracle of life, but with a water background now. It's not a bad idea in concept, a subtle way to illustrate opposing values between the two. You know, if Mothra and her kid had even the slightest opposing values. Yes, no worries everyone, the baby is on the way. Any second now. Two hours later. He's almost a quarter of the way there. 73 hours later, the larva finally washes up on the shore. Now this is the kind of fight I'm paying for, an old woman and a baby versus a space monster. I see this being an even match. I joke, but really this fight is great. The larva gets a chance to show off their unique arsenal of abilities. Like, way too many powers. Show him the zappy thing, Miles. This kid can turn himself invisible. Watch this. He can do it now. Camouflaged. All moths use camouflage. Yeah, come on. All moths have the optical camouflage from Metal Gear Solid. What are you, fucking stupid? The two work together. It's incredibly tense. Mothra and her baby are putting everything they have into this battle, but they're both in poor shape to be fighting and Desgidor is ruthless. There's no guarantee they're going to win. Especially this part where he tries to rip the larva into pieces. I think this scene alone is enough to warrant watching the movie. It's very exciting. Too bad the movie's already halfway over. Yep, aside from a frankly poor fight between the Elias earlier, we've gone this far in the movie without any monster action. We instead spent close to an hour with the human characters, and... I mean, I don't hate them, but damn are they uninteresting. Aside from providing the setting, they offer nothing. I'll give them credit in that their purpose is just to be an audience surrogate, just watching what's happening far above them. They're not scientists or something with a B-plot no one cares about. They don't take focus away from the kaiju, just time. A lot of time. As sad as it may be, I know we can't have a movie with just the monsters. But if we have to have talking characters, why not ones that are connected to Mothra, ones that know what's happening and are more interesting? You know, Mole and Laura and their conflict with Belvera? Speaking of actually interesting stuff, collateral damage escalates as the fight progresses, resulting in a dam being destroyed and the water behind it to come flooding down. While this does put a temporary stop to Desgidor's rampage, the larva is in danger of getting washed away by the waves. Like a good mother, the best mother even, Mothra flies in and brings her baby to safety. And her strength finally fails her out in the ocean. First of all, I want to commend the balls on Toho. Just one year prior, they killed Godzilla in a scene that still tugs at the heartstrings of G-fans watching. So, in their follow-up movie with their next most popular character, one aimed more at children, they kill her too. I like to imagine this scene traumatized young Japanese kids the same way The Land Before Time traumatized us. It definitely traumatized Mothra's kid, judging by the cry of anguish he lets out. One of the criteria I judge Godzilla films by the most heavily is the degree to which I can understand the emotions and characteristics of the kaiju without dialogue, and this scene here excels in that department. Obviously the two moths don't speak, but just from watching their movements, hearing the intonation of their chirps, understanding the context, all the pain of a young child trying in vain to save their mother, who has accepted her death and will pass gracefully into the next life, is here. Because in this continuity, Mothra does not reincarnate. Mothra is dead. 
All that's left of the Earth's Guardian is her progeny, now imbued with a deep sense of loss and a newfound determination, swimming off so they can gain the necessary power. And as an avatar of the planet, this cocoon is spun on an island covered in lush and ancient greenery, and a new form is awakened with help from another song from the Elias, gentle and soothing, Mothra Leo. Okay, I've been writing around this until now. Those multiple names for the Mothra larva that are all variations on a new Mothra theme? Well, despite those names suggesting that we're meant to take this child as a new incarnation of the same moth we know and love, that's just not the case. Their powers are so wildly different, their designs are different as can be seen in Imago form, and most prominently, this kid is a boy. And received her power. Fuck these dubs. You can tell by the differently shaped antenna, a detail taken from real male and female moths. And by the way, one of the purpose of those feather antennae is to sense the pheromones of female moths. Which means this kid is spreading his wings and on the hunt for puss! Therefore, we couldn't just call him New Mothra or Excelled Mothra. He is a unique character that deserves distinction beyond just a version of Mothra, whether that was Toho's intention or not. They certainly never tried to come up with a name that suggested a difference. Since there seems to be no reason why the song to awaken him is named Mothra Leo, it's been co-opted as his name too. I think it works. It shows he's a separate character while still being close enough to his mother to share a name, unlike Batra. Leo is a male name, so that confusion is mitigated, and it's a nice short name as well. Plus, this one is probably on me, but I always think of one specific thing when I hear the name Leo, and that's not a bad thing. As soon as he emerges, Leo proves his worth by going right into the battle with Desgidora, who's changed since the last time we saw him. <laughs> Check it out. It's got wings. There's not much to say about this fight because it's not much of a fight. Leo really kicks the shit out of Desgidora as vengeance for the sadism inflicted by the monster earlier. It's not a climactic conclusion, it's just a massacre that lasts for less than five minutes, but that doesn't mean I don't enjoy it. And why am I invested? Because it's Mothra Leo. Mothra Leo is my favorite kaiju, and I just want to watch him. Of course, he's got great genetics when it comes to being adorable, but I think he's even cuter than Mothra. I like the contrast of black and white fur on his main body, which looks extremely fluffy by the way, against his more colorful wings, green and orange that I find more visually appealing than Mothra's heavier emphasis on black against similar orange and yellow. In fact, I think Leo is easily the cutest kaiju ever created. And it's not just looks he's got going for him, but he's inherited his mother's benevolent guardian personality while also being more suited and willing in combat, with an ever-increasing list of moves, all with crazy names like Shine Strike Buster and Sparkling Pile Load. I've seen some complaints about Leo's gender in that Mothra was a paragon of the female form, a personification of feminine ideals of beauty, compassion, and motherly care, and that having a male Mothra ruins that. I agree that Mothra does indeed represent all of those things, and I see the weirdness inherent in Toho taking the most popular monster among women and making a movie with her son who is better in every way, but I find that Leo still embodies the same values for one reason. Femininity is not an exclusively female trait. Regardless of his sex, Leo still acts the same way his mother would. The only masculine personality trait he has is being more adept in battle, which was something Mothra never excelled at to begin with. This brings me to a little theory of mine. The Heisei Godzilla movies that had just concluded one year prior to this spent its second half building up Godzilla Jr., who started out as timid and docile as Manila, but by Godzilla vs. Destroyer was just as capable as his father, with one major difference. No ill will towards humans. If anything, he liked them, taking a bit of Mothra's attitude. 
Then the next year, Mothra has a child much like herself, but more willing to fight a bit of Godzilla's side. They're two opposing but necessary viewpoints, taking the best of each other with their children to make a more well-rounded succeeding generation, becoming better by breaking down the gender roles their parents fit into. I know that sounds like Godzilla and Mothra were both their parents, but I'm just stating the facts here. And by the way, the theme of future generations needing to adopt the best of prior generations to avoid destruction? One of Guren Lagan's themes as well. Look at that, I was going on about my love for this little moth boy and he's already beaten Desgidora into the dirt. The seal of Elias imprisons the beast once more and Belvera's plan is ruined. As his her gado gado, who is a robot. I need to know more about that. And even though she's shouting vengeance, they let her go. Belvera's really our sister. She's your sister? Wakaba, deep down you do love your brother, don't you? Ah, of course. That's what this movie was all about. The love between siblings. I mean, don't you remember all the times where that conflict was established? Well, get going then! I really hate you, Taiki! Well, I hate you too, so there! That one scene? If the core theme was going to be about familial relationships, wouldn't a parent-child one make more sense? You know, so the kaiju can participate instead of just being window dressing? As Leo gives a ride to the kids as thanks for their help keeping the seal safe, their parents look over the aftermath of the battle. Nature spent millions of years making all this, and we destroyed it all in a matter of minutes. So what now? It may not be too late to save the trees in the forest. It's going to take many years of hard work. Mm -hmm. True enough. That's a very important lesson. The damage we cause to nature can take thousands of years to fix. We need to be cautious about what we take from the world, and us and our future generations will have to work very hard in order to preserve the planet we live on. Or Mothra Leo can just fix it all for us. That's a bad lesson for an environmental movie to have. Personally, my explanation is that Leo is new to all of this. He just got too eager in fixing the problem that he didn't realize that people needed to learn. And thus, being the innocent good boy he is, Leo flies off and the movie ends on a triumphant note. In fact, the back half of this movie all around is great. From the point Mothra enters the fray, the human segments don't last long enough to take you down from the high of the fight, aside from the break between Mothra's death and Leo's transformation. There's no even tactical fights to be found, but what's here is intense and satisfying. It just takes sitting through the boring first half of the movie to get to it, which doesn't offer enough exposition or events to be worth the time. As a whole, it's a decent movie, one with a slow start but an excellent payoff. So, why do I get so into it? I think it's generally true of most Godzilla fans that we're kinder on the movies that feature our favorite monsters, but I like to think it goes a little further than that. When the movie gets good, it gets really good. That middle section with all three monsters fighting is seriously fantastic. I love Leo, I want to cuddle him so bad. Mothra is everything good she's always been. Desgador is nowhere near as iconic as his golden predecessor, but he works for the role. The good stuff, I think, is enough to justify watching it. It's just a problem of consistency. Which, I think you'd be hard-pressed to fill more than five fingers naming Godzilla movies where everything is good. This review should have done enough to fill in the gaps if you just want to skip to the second half, so you're not jumping around scattered scenes. The movie is at least good on a technical level. I mean... I can't say anything for the original acting quality, but it looks fine. Toho's traditional special effects with suits and puppets look as good as ever, though their compositing and CG looks like shit. And the soundtrack by Toshiyuki Watanabe and Akiko Yano is quite good. Plus, I want to give the visual design a special piece of credit in that this movie has a color. Green. 
This movie doesn't use urban settings. It pretty much all takes place in this forest. So the plant life, the life energy, Leo himself all exude this uniform coloration, which makes Desgador burning it down all the more visually striking. It's a consistency beyond what the script can offer. We have to assume this movie performed well because Toho stayed the course for once and continued onwards and Rebirth of Mothra became the start of a trilogy. I don't have much to say about 2 and 3, just that neither of them have the same appeal as the original. 3 at least delivered on some action, but the strong emotional connection from this entry is nowhere to be found. They're not terrible movies, I can even find some enjoyment in Rebirth of Mothra 2, but the trilogy peaked early. The trilogy peaked with this one scene. So if that's the case, where the hell has Leo been all these years? He was a flash in the pan, he had his movies, he had his merchandise, he had his one appearance on Godzilla Island, and then he disappeared for 17 years, only coming back as one of many characters in the mobile games. Even when he shows up on the cover of Save the Earth, he's not actually there. After Legendary nailed Mothra in King of the Monsters, it's time for more Mothra stuff that brings back her family as well. I'd scream if they even acknowledged Leo in a movie again. Bring back Godzilla and, but not educational and with way more characters. Thank you all for sticking with me for 50 episodes, among everything else I do on this channel as well. Now don't worry, I'm not planning to completely abandon games like other previously game-focused YouTubers have done. I just wanted to do something special for the occasion. And if this worked out well, I can do more movie reviews in the future. I'm sure I'll have to do the Bionicle movies at some point because 50 episodes later and I still can't escape the clutches of my first episode.